But the theme was something that I thought would be helpful for a lot of people. Um, we haven't really talked about it in quite a while. And, um, and yet it is something, especially uh, from the view of Tibetan Buddhism and from the yogic traditions, uh, this quality that we call um, sort of tapas. I don't know if has anyone heard this term. It's a Sanskrit term, tapas. Yeah, Stacy has. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it's so. It, it's this is not the uh, the little hors d'oeuvres you find in a Spanish restaurant. Uh, this is a Sanskrit term, although those are wonderful, and sometimes they can be heat building too. Uh, this form is this term anyway. Is it means uh, cooking. Literally in Sanskrit, it means cooking or heating, yeah? Uh, and there's an ancient Sanskrit text that deals with what's called tapta marga. Tapta marga, marga is path. Tapta is, is cooking all, right? And so largely the, uh, this text, it's, it's been out a long time, written by a Sanskritic scholar called cooking the world, cooking the world, tapta marga, the path of heat. Um, when I was in college and I was studying Sanskrit and uh, Hindu and Buddhist traditions and such, uh, I remember reading this book and it was old then, and we're going back to the year 2000. So anyway, <laughs> the classic text. Um, anyway, the point here is that uh, the cultivation of heat is an ancient practice that we find in many traditions in many cultures. And although, um, in the Himalayas, you know, we find uh, Tibetan monks also in India now who have perfected this practice of heat building. And we're going to talk a little bit about sort of regionally why that might have been helpful. But you also have yogis in very hot climates that talk about this process of tapas or uh, building heat, not just as a way to stay warm, but also as a purification, as a healing um, it has a way of refining the toxins of the mind, if you will. So it's many layered. And we're going to do sort of a variation tonight of a Tibetan uh, practice called Tumo. Tumo is T-U-M-M-O. Is a, uh, it's a breath practice that is very powerful to build heat in the body. It's something that's been practiced by Tibetan yogis for a long, long time. <clears throat> there was a study done by Herbert Benson I don't know if any of you know who Herbert Benson is. He uh, was a, sort of the founder of what we call the relaxation response, which is a sort of a con contemplative based training for stress reduction and physical health. Uh, Mass General Hospital here in Boston is where sort of the Benson Henry Institute is. He's done a lot of research. He and also Sarah Lazar, who is she, in her own right, is a psychologist. She's done a lot of research on meditation and body and health and wellness. Well, back in 1981, um, Herbert Benson was fascinated after he met the Dalai Lama about the power of meditation and especially for healing and for well being. And so he traveled to India and somehow ended up, and I don't know the details of how this came to be. But uh, he ended up doing a study um, of Tibetan monks who meditated in 40 degree uh, room with 49 degree uh, cold, wet towels that they put over their shoulders, basically, to meditate in an effort to build heat and kind of to study this interesting phenomena that had never quite been studied empirically before. And the idea was, the, the agenda here was for these monks to actually dry three different towels in succession. So um, what they found was that by uh, practicing, and they practiced for 100 days before they actually conducted this study. It's not like they just sort of pulled them out of the monastery and said, here, sit here and melt these cold towels, or rather, warm these cold towels. But uh, they had to work up to this, of course. Um, and one of the first things they noticed was steam coming off of the towels. Um, and so there are stories, many stories of this kind of in the, uh, in the Tibetan region and also among the caves of the Himalayas where, uh, where really they can 
they tend to get very, very cold in the winters. And so there are stories of monks and yogis and nuns. Uh, I've actually heard of also some women who have practiced deeply these things that actually end up melting the snow around them where they're sitting. And they're wearing not much more than like a wool blanket, basically. Uh, and this is from people I've actually known who have actually witnessed uh, these whom I trust very much. So we know there's, there's a lot more here than meets the eye. Uh, and, and part of the view of the yogis is that there is a whole dimension uh, that, that, if you will, interweaves the world of matter with the world of consciousness in a way that is um, that we haven't even begun to understand yet. So at least here in, in the West. Well, this notion of building heat is actually quite natural to meditation. I hope that you have heat in your homes and you have been comfortable over the last few days here. Um, it certainly is worth being grateful for these things. Uh, and yet it's also true that when the weather is warm, um, that we still can continue to build heat wherever we're practicing. And I mean, I've had experiences in deep retreat where the sweat is just dripping off my body and it's even if it's not particularly hot. So I've had had experiences quite often where my body temperature rises simply through practice. Um, now in the studies that they've conducted, they have measured vital signs, body temperature, heart rate, other things, uh, and have found some pretty interesting results from the practice. But the point here isn't to try to emulate these kind of advanced techniques. So, you know, if before you go out and try to melt snow with a wool blanket, let me know first, okay? Let me consult with you. <laughs> um, maybe you can teach me a thing or two if you do it and it's successful. But anyway, the point here is um, that this is a very natural outcome of meditation in general. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about mindfulness practice or we're intentionally building heat in the body through some kind of tapas practice. Um, and um, so why is building heat? Why is it interesting? Why is it important? And so his, this is where kind of the various dimensions uh, arise is on one hand, heat itself is seen to be purifying. So it's also a practice of purification. It's almost like boil, boiling water to kill the, the bad bacteria before you drink it. Um, in a way, what we're doing when we're healing from an illness, really relying on body heat. So we can look at this at once, both in the physical, the somatic, building heat. Building heat actually helps to, um, to uh, increase our immunization, our cells that fight off infection and such. When our resistance gets low, we become vulnerable to these things because our body temperature rise, uh, lowers, drops. So it's both a physical uh, necessity. If you live in a cold climate, as some of these yogis have done, you know, it's important to build that heat, but it's also purifying for the body. It's also purifying from the standpoint of karma. So the patterns, the tendencies of consciousness that maybe we're not so proud of. The things that hook us, the reactive habit body, the patterns of reactivity, of anger, depression, meanness, whatever is there. Um, ultimately, the three poisons, yeah? uh, greed, hate, hatred, and delusion, otherwise known as like clinging and clutching and desiring in a greedy kind of way, aversion, rejection, harsh judgment, and just simply uh, not being wise about the nature of who we are and the nature of experience. So uh, a lot of these things are seen as poisons, as ailments that we, uh, with heat building, actually just naturally uh, help us with uh, purifying these aspects of mind and emotions. Um, we've done a karma burning meditation here a little while back that every once in a while we'll do that together where we visualize the inner fire at the bottom of the base of the spine, just sort of right in the center of the body 
around the navel and uh, slightly below where we visualize a fire here and any kind of activity or impulses or um, kind of nervousness, fear, whatever comes up, we visualize it as burning it off in that fire and turning into smoke that lifts out through the crown so that whatever arises is quickly burned and then just goes up. And by doing this, this requires relaxation, deep relaxation and a sense of stillness so that we're riding these waves of these impulses, but we're not feeding them and we're not fighting them and we're not just sort of following them. We're letting them just kind of move through and burn while we cultivate stillness. So this is, it's a, it's a lovely practice. It's karma burning. Um, it's another approach. Yeah. It was something that Leslie, my teacher taught us many years ago, um, more kind of a yogic practice. Anyway, I think that's on the YouTube channel somewhere on the under guided meditations, if you're interested. Um, and in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, in the, in the Tibetan Tantras, there is a relationship between three qualities. First of all, we often talk about the brightness, the luminosity, the radiance of mind. Yeah. And this sense of pristine acuity, acuity of mind, of clarity, that is so clear, it is so pristine that it is almost, it is bright like a crystal reflecting light. This is underlying nature of mind. We don't have to make this happen. It is seen to be there, but it is also very refined, very subtle. So within this quality, there is this quality of light. And at the heart of that is the source of heat. It's the source uh, of warmth. And here, when we're, when we're uh, talking about warmth, we're talking about both this capacity of heat I mentioned a minute ago to be purifying uh, and it's also the heat of love. It's also the heat of what we can call chanda. Chanda is a Sanskrit term for desire. But in this case, it's not desire that is sort of greedy or stimulus driven, but it is a desire for wholesome practice. It is a desire for well-being, for flourishing. It is a desire for ultimate liberation. So here, desire is a good thing. It's, it's a helpful thing. We need to be inspired. It's what we might call that kind of deep inspiration that keeps us on the path, chanda. Um, in college, I did a uh, comparison of chanda with uh, other forms of desire, such as like sexual desire and emotional clinging and all of that. It's very interesting when you start sort of breaking down these various uh, layers of desire. But their point is, there is wholesome desire here. It keeps us going. It keeps us almost a call from this fundamental nature of mind that is just gently coaxing us to come home. This is how I like, this is often how I experience it. And it's just there. It's available. It's almost like a divine invitation to just come back. It is sweet. It is also the source of this third quality, what is often called bliss or joy. So here we have light, heat, bliss, this sort of triune of qualities. And heat and warmth is also that, what we might call the, the progenitor of this quality of love. So cultivating heat is also cultivating a sense of well-being. It is interesting, too, that um, the study that Herbert Benson did with these Tibetan monks, one of the priorities they said was, we are able to kind of raise our heat, not just because of mind control, but because of this very, very profound motivation and aspiration to be loving. Isn't that interesting? That compassion, love at this level, yeah? This is, we're not necessarily talking about romantic love or anything, but we're talking about this deeper 
more spacious form of boundless compassion and love, that this, uh, this motivation fuels, it's like the, the, the wood being put onto the fire, if you will, that gives the fire its chanda. Isn't that interesting? I, I find that quite interesting how all these things fit together. There's also a, another layer here where um, the four kayas, and we're not, we're not going to go into too much detail here. The four kayas, kaya is a Sanskrit word which means body or formation. And there are seen to be three, in some cases, three kayas, or three bodies. In other cases, four in Tibetan Buddhism, they recognize four. And the first kaya is the body of form, which is like our physical body. It's basically the body that is manifested. We're born into this, these human forms. Then the second body, and this is the one that I was going to reference, is the Sambhogakaya. Sambhogakaya, the, the sort of the body of energy, the body of bliss, if you will, the body of, um, of fire is another way to think of it. And then the third is the Dharmakaya, the body of consciousness, of truth, of wisdom, basically wisdom consciousness or enlightened consciousness, dharmakaya. This is consciousness at its most re, uh, sort of refined form as the Buddha represents to us. Yeah? And then there is a, a fourth one that isn't often talked about called svabhavikakaya. <laughs> That's a mouthful, svabhavikakaya, which is largely a union of the first three. It is a unified state of, all, of, of beingness. Largely here, we are seeing what's called the Dharma Datu. Has anybody heard this term, Dharma Datu? It's a great term. It is that the entire universe of creation, of manifested creation, is a Buddha field. In some traditions, we might call the Dharma Datu as being a sort of God's creation. Yeah, but it is a vibrant, luminous, uh, sort of wakeful, conscious process. And from the Buddhist view, it is largely the consciousness. It is the field of the Buddha, of Buddha consciousness. Many names we can bring to this, but even quantum mechanics has something like this in the anthropic principle and, you know, other notions of vibratory frequencies that are connected across dimensions. I mean, pretty wild stuff. But the point here is that this Dharma Datu, this Buddha field, um, also is made of this luminosity, of this fire. If you will, the light of Amitabha Buddha is all pervasive. Yeah. So I love talking about this. I could keep on going, but uh, I want to kind of reel it back to what we're going to do tonight. Um, so, okay, great. So how do we then cultivate all these things? Now that we've sort of taken it from the personal, from being cold and shivering to now looking at the entire sort of luminous vibration of the universe. We just did that, by the way, in about 10 minutes. So it's proof that truth is not bound to time one way or the other. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, so bringing this back to ourselves, to our subtle body, to the Samboga Kaya, that what can also be called the body of bliss. And largely it's called this because it is the energy body where a lot of this practice and a lot of this work unfolds in wholesome ways, where we can begin to vibrate at much higher frequencies with our meditation. It builds up heat, it purifies, and we also feel softer and more gentle and more loving when we do this. And these things are all kind of interconnected. There is a um, lovely healing meditation uh, by Tulku Tondup, who is local here to Cambridge. He's a uh, Tibetan teacher, born and raised in Tibet, and has written many books, one of which is called Boundless Healing. And the entire book is dedicated to uh, this light, heat, bliss uh, meditation. Uh, it's something that I did at Dana-Farber. It's with patients occasionally, uh, cancer patients, where we would cultivate uh, these three different stages. Now, Tulku Tondup's book has a chapter for each stage. 
And the book is what, 300 pages or so. So it's, he goes very, very much in depth with what he calls cells of light. The meditation is called cells of light. And we're not gonna do that here tonight. We can do it sometime, uh, but it's a powerful healing practice. But largely here, um, if there's still some chill in your bones, we can certainly dive in and practice some heat building. And one of the ways that we begin is of course, with the breath, as we always do with the breath. Um, so uh, right off the bat, let's say you're not on a cushion, but you're out somewhere and you're just feeling the chill of winter. Yeah, and you're just, oof, just I've been doing this a lot lately. <laughs> Um, is to do what's called ujjayi breathing, ujjayi breath. It's a yogic breath. It's a pranayama practice. Uh, it's relatively simple. Um, and largely what it does is it, you, you're basically making a sound as you breathe in through the nose. You're gently holding or cradling the breath. And then as you breathe out through the, you can breathe out through the nose. I believe you can also do it by exhaling through the mouth. Um, you're making the same sound. And what is the sound? Well, it's the same sound that you make if you are uh, hushing or fogging glasses. This is often in yoga classes how people have said it to me. Um, where you, you know, you're sort of breathing fog out onto your glasses. Only if you do this with your mouth closed, what does it sound like? You can try it briefly. in and out in that way. And what I often will do is focus on opening the back of the throat. So as I do this, I just relax and open slightly. Sort of this area of the, uh, just above the Adam's apple. And just to let that, that breath go through more naturally, more easily. Now, um, there's more to it than that when we do Jai breathing or uh, Tumo, what we call Tumo breath or purification breath, uh, and that is you're breathing deeply. So as you inhale, you're, you're breathing all the way in down to the belly and around the lower back with this breath. So we can try that together too. And then gently we hold and then breathe out slowly all the way out, making that same sound. I often think of an ocean. You know how you pick up a seashell and you listen to <laughs> the ocean and the seashell? Uh, it is so soothing to do if you're having trouble sleeping. Even though it can be, this can be an energizing breath, it can also be relaxing. And so lying there, well, what I've done in the past, I, I never have trouble falling asleep. That is my, the last thing in the world I struggle with. But um, on those occasions that I have, I've done this breath and imagined that the inhale is like uh, an ocean just washing up onto, sh onto the shore where it just pauses. And then as, it, as I breathe out, the sound is that of the ocean receding back out. And it's just so soothing. So you can try this if you like, uh, if you have any problems with insomnia or sleeping and really making it a whole body experience. Yeah. So, um, the way that Tumo works often is with this kind of breath, and we breathe down into the area of the navel, and we gently hold. Now, there is a process in Tumo. We're not gonna do that too much tonight. You can try it if you like, but it can take a little practice where you, you push the, the, the muscles of the belly below the navel. You give a push and exhale just a little bit of breath. So you're breathing in again, with this quality of ujjayi breath. And you can either hold here or out the nose, just letting out a little bit of breath and then holding again and then exhaling. Now this may take a little practice to breathe in enough breath uh, on the initial inhale to where you don't have to expel it all right away. And um, part of this practice is that the sound that you hear in your 
senses as you breathe in can also be really focusing for the mind. If your mind is jumpy and it's just hard to focus, this also makes this a really helpful practice. Just to concentrate on breathing in a very somatic sensory way, yeah? where you can feel and hear. And you might even feel the warmth arising as you do this. And there's one more step that we can do with Tumo, and that is to imagine as we breathe in down to that uh, navel, that spot just below the navel and in the middle of the body. And imagine here just this inner fire. This is so Tumo is a practice of quote unquote inner fire. Yeah? It's similar to Kundalini in the uh, early sort of Kundalini text, the Kundali Upanishad, which is one of the earliest uh, uh, yogic texts where we find a lot of these practices. So breathing in deeply down, down into this fire of the belly, and then just hold here and really feel the sense of warmth arising from here. And then breathing out, we breathe out from the belly. And as we do this, we're really focusing on um, not just the image of the fire, but the sensory quality, this sort of luminosity, this, this subtle glow, this light, this golden gl luminosity here that begins to, to radiate and spread and fill the entire inner space of the body. So trying it again. Hold and just imagine this fire, the glow from this fire. And breathing out, breathing back up the central channel as you exhale. Almost like we're breathing in a thread of light from the nose all the way down to the navel and to the middle of the body. Holding, feeling an expansion of this glow from this inner fire and then breathing out back up this thread of light, this sort of central channel, this luminous tube, <laughs> if you will, and then breathing out. Now, what you can also do here, if you like, is on the exhale, imagine that this subtle glow traveling back up the body reaches up to the crown of the head. So you're not just breathing it out the nose, but you're also um, allowing this ascension, if you will, of this luminous quality in the fire up into the crown and then sort of fanning out at the top. This is to begin with uh, with just sort of a natural rhythm. There okay. are, as we practice more advanced forms of this, we will be holding that interval for a longer, longer period of time. What's called kumbhaka or breath retention. So like breathing in deeply, and then what the yogis will do is they'll hold their breath for a long period of time, maybe sipping a little bit of air in and releasing a little like a psh. Yeah, the, but these are more advanced practices. And part of the thing is you want to work up to this because you don't want to aggravate the nervous system doing this. <laughs> Often this is where people run into some, some issues with these practices, is they're trying too hard or you know, they're trying to sort of hold it until they can't hold it anymore. And that's not the point here. Yeah. What we want to do is practice it naturally. So initially, what, like what we're doing, we're doing a very safe kind of intro version of this is just to breathe it in, in an open, easy way and gently cradle it and, and hold it with some gentle awareness some love. Like we're holding a newborn. This is often how I think of it. It's just so, you know, so gentle that we're, we're holding it lovingly, yeah, and allowing the warmth of that experience to really sort of rise naturally, just as we can feel the oxytocin if we're holding a baby, yeah, <laughs> just all those chemicals start arising, these beautiful, wonderful chemicals. Um, so that's the spirit of it anyway. And um, now there are also in Tumor practice, uh, the next stage of this is you chant. There are two syllables. There's Ram and there's Hum. Yeah. Ram, Ram, Hum. And we're not going to do that. Now, if you, if you find you'd like to, 
I'll go for it. So HOM, H-U-M, is the syllable of compassion. It's that which arises naturally in the heart. It's the uh, Karuna syllable. Karuna is compassion. And I'd have to go back and remind myself what the RAM is. <laughs> I don't remember offhand. RAM. If anybody knows, please chime in. Um, but the HOM is really the part where we're building heat uh, within the heart itself. So there are there are variations, but for our purposes uh, now, Anne, we're just going to breathe in with that Ujjayi breath and gently hold. And as I mentioned, if you want to just sort of uh, push from uh, the belly, the lower area of the navel, just engage those muscles, muscles and just push a little bit of air out a few times and then hold again and then breathe, you, that's certainly okay to do. That is a safe thing to do. <clears throat> 